The saga of Silent War really began in the days of the Medusa 5 campaign. For those of you who don't remember that, this was a worldwide 40k campaign that was run by Games Workshop in a similar vein to the Third War for Armageddon and the Eye of Terror campaign. Whereas those two games had had a release of their own special codex with unique army lists in it and so forth, whereas the Medusa 5 campaign uh, came with a funky little booklet that you got in White Dwarf that just set out a, a bit of the background of the system, what the stakes were in the campaign, gave a map of the planet itself, and uh, a little bit of involvement of what each of the different races were doing as part of that. It also came with a full-size map, uh, which featured, again, some of the major war zones of uh, Medusa 5, as well as a more detailed map of one of the main hives. One of the things I loved about the Medusa 5 campaign was that they had a uh, essentially news report from the front that when you submitted your game results you could also submit a piece of fiction that you'd written about what happened during your game and then somebody at Games Workshop collated some of the best bits each week from that short fiction and published it in a uh, sort of weekly newscast essentially called Vox Veritas, the voice of truth that would deliver the imperial truth from the front. Um, my local gaming group decided it would be quite cool to have our own little news reporter that um, essentially broadcast what was happening in our particular sector of Medusa 5. And to that end, I knocked up a little miniature of a journalist uh, who I dubbed Stalker Johnson. I wonder where I got the inspiration for that name from. Uh, but anyway, he would then turn up on the table uh, during our games and he would observe what was happening in the game and I would write up a little report just from his point of view, literally from sticking my head down on the tabletop and seeing what it was that he could see and then reporting that back to Vox Veritas as news from the front. The biggest battle that he watched over though was a massive uh, battle between the forces of chaos and a beleaguered Imperial Guard army supported by sisters from the Order of the Bloody Rose. Uh, this was an all-day-long Saturday game in a similar vein to um, the Battle of Glacier's Creek, I suppose, would be the next most comparable thing, with a huge kind of complex in the centre of the board, and then wave after wave of traitor guard and chaos marines pouring in, demons, gribbly spawn, the whole shebang. Uh, pouring in and trying to overwhelm the beleaguered Imperial defenders. Part of the narrative um, background that we decided on essentially for the reason why this battle was taking place was we decided that a, an arch heretic who had been active throughout the zone during the preceding weeks of our games had been captured by the Inquisition and was being interrogated down in the uh, sub-basement of the complex and this is what the Chaos Forces were trying to recapture before he could give away some of their secrets. To that end, we needed an Inquisitor. And I was playing Sisters of Battle at the time and used the then 3rd, then 4th edition Codex, Witch Hunters, to knock up an Inquisitor. And that is where Inquisitor Silence comes from. And Silence is, in fact, where the Silent in Silent War comes from. Um, anybody who can guess which figure from fiction I based Inquisitor Silence's name on um, and mentions it in the comments down below, I'll send you some kind of small prize. The battle also saw the first appearance of a now fairly notable traitor guard unit, uh, the Vostok traitor guard. Uh, this has made appearances in the most recent Adeptus Custodes Codex and actually in a really awesome book which you should definitely read by the name of Steel Tread. Uh, that's a story by Andy Clark in which a Lehman Rust demolisher ends up stranded behind enemy lines and has to battle through some of the worst things that Chaos has to offer as it fights to get back to the Imperial forces and survive. Uh, the main enemy in that novel is what used to be Andy's traitor guard unit, uh, and that is where the Vostok come from. And I think Inquisitor Silence therefore has the notable distinction of being the first representative of the Imperial forces to fight against the Vostok Traitor Guard alongside noble Commissar McCabe who had command of the Imperial Guard units that were present there. Um, the end result of that was I kind of then used Inquisitor Silence through sort of all the rest of the games for the next few years that I played using my Sisters of Battle and he became kind of just a regular feature of the background of our little kind of local narrative. 
When it came time for me to run some games of our local uh, sort of annual campaign weekend, narrative campaign weekend, SVA, for those who used to go to that, um, again, I just had him as a kind of a background character in my mind who would um, be sending missives or um, missions to Imperial forces as they battled across uh, whatever sector that happened to be the setting for the campaign that year. I was fortunate enough to be one of the playtesters for the Dark Heresy role-playing game. And uh, again, if you're not entirely familiar with that, the idea behind it was that you played a group of acolytes under the instruction of an Inquisitor uh, operating on inquisitorial business. And it just made sense for me to use Inquisitor Silence as the uh, individual who was sending out my group of hapless players on these various suicide missions. Uh, a few years after that, when I decided to run a role-playing campaign where one week a group of players would play as Imperial Forces, the next week a group of players would play as Chaos Forces, and they would be uh, essentially fighting against each other without ever actually knowing what each group was up to. It just made sense again to use Inquisitor Silence for that. And uh, that's also really where I think the setting for Silent War developed. I created a sandbox for my players to roam around in, a group of three or four different sectors, a uh, group of three or four different subsectors within uh, the Punic Worlds sector, as I called it. And uh, this was where the majority of the stories that took place during the role-playing sessions took place. So I guess that's really where we pick the story of Inquisitor Gabriel's silence up. Um, in his early days, he was just an Inquisitor of the Ordo Hereticus. Uh, he had a retinue uh, composed of uh, a chirurgeon, a bounty hunter by the name of Needles, and a couple of uh, sort of arbitrators that I used uh, the Necromunda Enforcer models for to represent uh, Crusaders. Um, he fought against the forces of Chaos and uh, Xenos Psychers uh, for a few years before eventually assign ascending to the role of Lord Inquisitor of the Punic Worlds. Uh, this is a group of planets in the galactic northwest, uh, not far from the Eye of Terror, uh, and I decided that this would be um, the setting where uh, all of my future campaign games and all of my role-playing games took place. So he set up Hurt Shop on Remus Prime, the central world of the Punic Worlds, uh, in the Riemann subsector. And uh, from there, he instructed various forces to go out on missions to uh, further the cause of the Imperium. One individual that he had cause to instruct was his former interrogator, now newly minted Inquisitor, a man called Maddock Gunn. Gunn was a trusted acolyte of Inquisitor Silence and also the main character uh, of my friend Murray during our Dark Heresy Black Crusade campaign. Um, he worked together with a Space Wolf Rune Priest, uh, played by one of the players, and an Ultramarines champion, uh, as well as a Vindicare assassin and just a, a luckless guardsman, um, who had to try and prevent the forces of Chaos from recovering uh, a dark and arcane text that had once belonged to a traitor Inquisitor I created for some of the campaign games uh, by the name of Grendel Call. Silence sent this group on various different kind of suicidal missions around the sector. They delved into the depths of the Underhive of uh, Hive World Nicodemus. Uh, there they fought against a rising uh, plague of disbelief, uh, which led to Maddock Gunn exercising his ultimate authority and essentially gassing the lower levels of the Hive, rather than allow the contagion to spread, something that brought him into conflict with both the uh, members of the Astartes chapter, who expressed their displeasure with acts of violence upon his person, leading to him needing bionic reparation. Beyond that, they travelled to the uh, penal colony of Nemo, again in search of the Chaos Sorcerer that was spreading this uh, sort of Nurgle plague across the subsector, before eventually fighting a showdown in the ruins of the Blitzworlds uh, on the planet Skald, where they uh, faced off against the other group of players, uh, Chaos Marines and a Heretech and a Rogue Psyker. And it's there that Maddock Gunn showed his true colours and betrayed his master and the rest of his companions uh, and, in fact, the Emperor uh, by seizing the uh, heretical text for himself, abandoning 
the rest of the players and uh, his comrades on the battlefield uh, to fight it out against the forces of chaos and fleeing into the night with this heretical text to do Emperor only knows what. Uh, this really caught me by surprise. It was something apparently Murray had been planning for the whole campaign, was that uh, Maddock Gunn was running his own angle on this. And it really, uh, I think, was the genesis then of the narrative that carried us through the Silent War for the like, next five years. When I decided to do Silent War, I think it was important to me that um, I not put myself uh, at the centre of it. I thought it was important that we hero the characters that were being created by the other players. And I'll talk in another video a little bit more about the mechanic of how this worked. But what I therefore decided to do was to start the whole campaign with the idea that Inquisitor Silence had fallen. Silence has fallen, as Doctor Who had it. Um, the very first story that was told at the start of the very first campaign pack for Silent War was that he'd been uh, attacked by assassins, that he was clinging to life uh, by a thread uh, at the hands of his um, chirurgeon, that the only surviving members of his retinue were his trusted chirurgeon and Needles the Bounty Hunter, and that he would go into hiding and he'd had to abandon his role as Lord Inquisitor of the Punic Worlds, and in particular the vault that was in his palace on Remus Prime had been left undefended. And that was the impetus really for the first story, uh, the first weekend of Silent War, where people brought their own Inquisitors alongside their different 40k armies to battle it out to see who could seize the prize of their choice of items from the Silent Vault. Having uh, chosen not to use uh, Inquisitor Silence uh, in the campaign, I created my own new Inquisitor, the first new Inquisitor I'd created actually in nearly a decade um, to use alongside the army. I created uh, Rosalyn Silence, Inquisitor Silence's now grown daughter, uh, using the Cotias rules, and uh, she uh, set out to protect her father's legacy and to defend uh, his vault against those who might unleash whatever uh, fell relics he had sequestered away there to try and protect the Imperium from. As it happens, Maddock Gunn, that treacherous wretch, uh, actually won the campaign that weekend and uh, successfully made off with uh, something from the vault, some unspecified item, uh, with me swearing revenge for the following year. Good-naturedly, we reconvened 12 months later. The plotline for Silent War 2 then, and the continuation of the saga, is that Maddock had successfully arranged an item to be removed from the vault whilst he was keeping everybody else distracted, fighting across the different worlds of the Bunic Sector, uh, and uh, it had been squirrelled away on one of the planets. But what everyone was fighting for there for Silent War 2 was to discover firstly what relic Maddock had uh, made off with, and secondly, whereabouts uh, his agent had hidden it in the Punic Worlds. Uh, I created a few different MacGuffins that it could be. Uh, the Panarch's Crown, uh, a uh, dark crystalline um, crown that would be worn uh, by a uh, rogue psyker that had commanded an entire world until being brought low by uh, Inquisitor Silence. Uh, the Sankara Stone, some ancient pre-imperial uh, rocks that seemed to grant whoever kept them the power of an Eternal. The Eagle Stone, a piece of fulgurite that had been shaped into the uh, form of an Aquila and was said to have been created by the moment that the Emperor first set foot in the Punic Worlds during the Great Crusade. Uh, a relic from the Sons of Medusa's ancient history. Uh, details, perhaps, that might shed some light on that schism that uh, very nearly split them from the Imperium. There was a, a whole wave of bits. Oh, there was a, a, a um, data core that uh, quite possibly appeared to have come from an ancient Fenrisian vessel and might have some clue as to where the lost Primarch Lehman Russ had disappeared. All these different items had allegedly been taken from uh, Inquisitor Silence's vault and the players uh, fought it out to try and find which one had been taken and where it was located. I took a new Inquisitor that year. I decided it was time uh, to bring out the big guns and I created Inquisitor Solomon Thorson, uh, a, a fierce uh, Puritan uh, monodominant uh, who led a coalition of uh, Imperial Guard, Black Templar and Mechanicum forces uh, in search of specifically the heretic Maddock Gunn with the intention of bringing him to justice. 
The army I used that year was inspired by the Mechanicus trilogy by Graham McNeil. And again, I can hardly recommend that. It's an excellent book series. It fired my imagination and made me want to take a force that was representative of the forces that were used during that trilogy. Uh, Maddock, meanwhile, was desperately scrabbling around trying to find where his agent had concealed this trophy so that he could continue with whatever nefarious schemes he was about. Other Inquisitors, uh, meanwhile, that were seeking after these relics uh, were returning characters Inquisitor Jones, uh, a uh, member of the Order Historicus, a subsect of the uh, Inquisition who believed that Imperial knowledge must be preserved uh, and by best doing so to keep it within a museum. Uh, fighting against him was his rival, the Inquisitor created by uh, another player that weekend, uh, Inquisitor Belloc, who believed instead it was best that these items be uh, recovered and used for the greater glory of the Imperium. Uh, we had a rogue orc weird boy who claimed to be a radical member of the Ordo Xenos, uh, that had uh, transplanted his mind into the body of an orc weird boy to go behind enemy lines, only for the weird boy to wake up on the operating table, seize control of his mortal form, and even now be running around the Punic worlds, uh, insisting that squads of Astartes get stuck in you beakies. Uh, there was uh, Arbiter Ian's Inquisitor returning for his second year. Uh, as you may have guessed from his name, Arbiter Ian, uh, who again, if you haven't checked out his channel, check out his YouTube channel is a big fan of the Adeptus Arbites, and so brought uh, Inquisitor Judge Fred, uh, who was determined to lay down the law on the Punic worlds. So all, all of these different Inquisitors were, were fighting it out uh, to try and uh, recover uh, the relics that had been taken from Inquisitor Silence's vault, whichever one it was that Maddox had made off with. Uh, there was also uh, a couple of members of the Adeptus Mechanicus. I allowed people to take Magos those years, and an Ecclesiarch who claimed that he was at, that all items were property of the Church. Because of the ongoing rivalry with Maddox, I asked Murray if he'd be willing to put Maddox's life on the line uh, for the course of the story, and uh, he was readily up for this. Uh, and I offered him, therefore, uh, an incentive of additional campaign points for every game in which he was willing to put Maddox's skin in the game. This was an element that I then carried on into future uh, campaign weekends, as it's proved so popular, but in essence, uh, Maddox's player got additional campaign points for every game that he was willing to put uh, his Inquisitor's life on the line, provided he won more than half of his games, then uh, he would uh, remain alive and continue to be a part of the narrative. The final showdown of the weekend then was between my Inquisitor, uh, Solomon Thorson, and Maddock Gunn and his Drukian Imperial Guard. Uh, Murray had by that point, I think, kept Maddock alive for two of uh, the four games that he had played. So this was the decider. If Maddock died in the last game, that was it. He was dead for life as far as the narrative of the Silent War uh, campaigns were concerned. If, on the other hand, he triumphed, then uh, he would continue to uh, get up to whatever nefarious schemes he was about. Uh, the very much last turn of the game ended up in a, a melee combat uh, between Maddock and Thorson. And, and fair play to Murray for he could have moved his Inquisitor away from mine and just kind of hung back and uh, sweated it out but he, we both agreed it would be awesome to have a showdown between the two characters uh, and in the end uh, Gunn met his end under the gleaming demon hammer of Inquisitor Thorson. As it turned out the item that had been taken was in fact the Eagle Stone and so this was recovered. Um, however, Moving the narrative forward, the saga continued the following year, uh, it turned out that several of the other items had indeed gone missing from the Silent Vault, and thus the narrative for the following year uh, was for uh, the players to try and find all of the other missing MacGuffins that had been taken, and either secure them once more to protect the Imperium, or go about using them for whatever uh, schemes and machinations they had in mind. Gunn wasn't available uh, that year, therefore, having now uh, been thoroughly squashed and uh, his soul banished into the warp by uh, Inquisitor Thorson, and so a new Inquisitor put in an appearance on what was rapidly becoming known as the Medosian faction. Uh, that was the first appearance of Inquisitor Elizabeth Tarbio, uh, who would then uh, be essentially Murray's Inquisitor for the next few years of the Silent War campaign. 
I meanwhile decided to uh, retire Thorson because he didn't quite fit with the 40k army that I wanted to use that year and instead uh, I decided I needed a new radical inquisitor uh, to take on um, the forces of the Tau that I were using. And uh, this was an ideal opportunity. I decided to bring back an Inquisitor who I had used way back during the SVA days of campaign gaming. Uh, one of uh, Gunn's contemporaries, uh, another acolyte of Inquisitor Silence, uh, Inquisitor Lupin Decker, who had last been seen disappearing into a warp rift uh, to uh, close it uh, and protect the Imperial lines on the Blitz worlds uh, during SVA. Uh, so I brought him back, he came back out of the warp, but unfortunately not entirely untainted, uh, and uh, he teamed up with um, the forces of Commander Farsight uh, to try and secure these relics uh, for the greater good. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Inquisitor Tabio was about her own secret machinations, and there were mutterings that um, perhaps Gunn was not as dead as we had first thought. The fourth year of Silent War then brought a new character into the mix. Um, this was something that was inspired by the Eisenhorn trilogy. And again, I'm, I'm sure everyone's read Dan Abbott's Eisenhorn trilogy by this point, but if you haven't, get out there and read it. It's brilliant. The way in which Inquisitor Eisenhorn, um, and I'm sorry, slight spoilers here, the way in which Inquisitor Eisenhorn transitions from a young firebrand Puritan in the first book through to being uh, an older, radical, uh, almost some would say fallen Inquisitor, uh, willing to use the forces of chaos to his own ends by the end of the trilogy was really quite inspiring to me. And I decided to attempt to do the same thing over the next three years of Silent War games. So I created a brand new Inquisitor, uh, Inquisitor Sirius Drake of the Ordo Xenos, uh, and he uh, set out with uh, the forces of Catachan Imperial Guard uh, to um, try and instill order across the Silent Worlds. And he fought alongside other nominate, uh, sort of well-known um, Puritan Inquisitors uh, across the campaign. Um, there was a uh, map uh, allegedly to the, um, the original text that Manok Gunn had stolen way, way back at the start of our story. And uh, this was uh, found on the tattooed skin, flayed skin of an astropath that had once been in his service. The next year, the narrative moved forward uh, with uh, a rogue trader by the name of Lyceron Hall reporting that his ship, the Wild Road, which was a vessel I'd used in Battlefleet Gothic for many years, um, had encountered a space hulk breaching the borders of the Punic Sector, uh, an ancient uh, and malefic hulk by the name of the Sin of Omission uh, that was venturing into Imperial space. Inquisitor Drake, uh, continuing his journey into radicalism, teamed up with those notable 40k magpies, the Blood Ravens, uh, to try and recover an unspecified item from the heart of the Hulk. Um, meanwhile, uh, Inquisitor Tabio uh, continued her movements on behalf of the, Mad the Madosian uh, cult, uh, teaming up with a Space Marine chapter by the name of the Crimson Lament uh, for their own um, secretive goals. Uh, the whole thing came to a showdown between Inquisitor Jones and his father, Henry Jones Sr., uh, who had brought with him a huge swathe of radically, uh, fanatically loyal Imperial Guard uh, known as the Penitent Crusade. And if you haven't checked out my friend Lee's uh, Instagram, The Mediocre Modeler, it is well worth looking at uh, his Imperial Guard conversions. They are gorgeous. Uh, they featured on uh, the Hobby Roundup a number of times. Well worth a look. But yeah, a masked showdown between Inquisitor Drake and uh, Inquisitor Jones over what turned out to be an imprisoned demon prince in the heart of the Hulk uh, as uh, the various forces of the Inquisition battled to either try and propel the Hulk back into the warp or else to plunder its secrets. Uh, Jones and Drake faced off and Drake was triumphant uh, because I uh, beat the snot out of Lee's Imperial Guard and... Um, yeah, the Dark Demon Prince Graol uh, was uh, captured by Inquisitor Drake and taken away, bound into the form of one of his former acolytes. That then set the scene for uh, the next Silent War, which was to be the final um, corruption of Inquisitor Drake. And um, unfortunately, a global pandemic got in the way for the next two years. You may have heard about it, but that therefore prevented us from picking up Silent War until this year. Next month... The forces of the Silent War will be mustering at Warhammer World 
and uh, the story has reached the point where I've decided Inquisitor Silence has now been absent from his throne in the Imperial Palace on uh, Remus Prime in the Inquisitorial um, Conclave has gathered uh, to try and decide whether it is time to officially declare him, him dead uh, and uh, re appoint a new Lord Inquisitor. That then is where the narrative has picked up and the Medosian faction has uh, been uh, moving uh, behind the scenes, assassinating essentially small gatherings of the Conclave to try and uh, bring about a majority such that um, a certain Inquisitor long believed dead may well be able to return and claim his master's throne. Inquisitor Tabio, it would seem, has been in um, communication with an individual she dubs her master, and the only master that she is known to have had is Maddock Gunn. Uh, meanwhile, Inquisitor Drake and the now unbound demon host uh, of the Demon Prince Graol uh, have uh, sought to overturn all uh, comers and uh, spread the warp rift, essentially from the Great Rift, into the heart of the Punic Worlds, essentially turning them all into a, a greater version of the Poison Worlds that uh, loiter at the edge of the uh, Punic subsector uh, up against the border of the Great Rift. Uh, I'll let you know how things go. We're going to do a video at Warhammer World uh, essentially reporting on how the games progress and whether or not we get uh, a new Lord Inquisitor or whether the Punic Worlds themselves uh, drop straight into the warp and become Demon Worlds. Who can tell? Um, but I'm very excited uh, to finally get this part of the story progressing. And uh, if Maddock Gun does in fact come back to life, then whoever claims the throne of the Lord Inquisitor, it may well be time for Inquisitor Gabriel Silence to finish his recuperation and make a return. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for watching. The next video and the final video of this little series I plan to do uh, is going to be all about how the mechanics of the Silent War games work, and I will also be sharing the rules pack for this year's Silent War at that point, so that if you want to play any games using the, the mechanics in your own area, you'll be able to do so. In the meantime, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.